it's a pleasure to be here to talk about consumer and co-design considerations in research. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind overview. These are big topics and uh, the time we have won't do them justice. But uh, I just want to say um, we can share these slides with you all and Daniel and I would invite and indeed welcome any follow-up conversations or questions that we might not get through today. Uh, so, as Lisa has said, I have the privilege of being the Head of Research Impact and Consumer Involvement at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, and I'm also a research member of the Royal Children's Hospital Human Research Ethics Committee. And in this work, uh, I, I've, been, I've been in this role for seven years or so now, I've been really thinking about how we make impact uh, how we make research more impactful, how we do research in a more ethical and engaged and involved way. Uh, and in that work, I bring my professional experience, but I also bring my lived experience as a queer man. And you can see here that I use he, they pronouns. And I think taking an intersectional lens is the only way that we can ethically take an approach to the world and our work. We all bring uh, our lived and living experience in addition to our professional experience of the work that we do. And I would hope that that would meaningfully colour and inform uh, how we approach one another and indeed the world. Uh, and before I hand over to Nianiala to introduce herself, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I am speaking from this morning, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Nam, Melbourne, acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. But I'll hand to Nyanyal to introduce herself. Thank you, Ken, and thank you for that acknowledgement of country. My name is Nyanyal Young. I use she, her pronouns. As um, Lisa has mentioned, I am the Consumer and Impact Coordinator here at MCRI. I bring a lived experience of coming from a refugee and migrant background. Um, my family migrated to Australia in the early 2000s by the Humanitarian Health Program and Humanitarian um, Refugee Program. And so I've spent a considerable part of my life um, in this role of cultural and language broker between my family, my community and the wider Australian community. And so just really championing that intersectionality and bringing that lived experience, which has really influenced my passion for this space, particularly um, inclusion of voices that are traditionally marginalised in these conversations, particularly um, HREX and research practice. Thank you, Ken. Next slide. So Ken and I work at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute here at in Melbourne, NAM. We are the largest child health research institute in the Southern Hemisphere and we're the third largest globally. However, we don't work alone. We are a key part of Melbourne Children's Campus, which brings together four organisations. So firstly, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, which is us, the Royal Children's Hospital, the University of Melbourne's Department of Paediatrics, and the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation at a single campus in Parkville. Our campus purpose is to advance child and adolescent health through prevention, early intervention and health promotion together with the highest quality clinical care, research, education and training. Thank you, Danielle, for setting the scene. And so really our work is about giving every child the opportunity to live a healthy and fulfilled life. And so this uh, beautiful image here is some young people, children involved uh, in, in some of our research. Uh, and so this is our United Campus purpose. However, I think for a lot of us, our work more accurately feels a bit like this, uh, either being the beleaguered clinicians in this boat about to be swept away on a tsunami of the best available research uh, evidence in the form of journal articles, or inadvertently contributing to that tsunami in a way that will break over intended audiences in unproductive ways. And as I've already said, our approach really is to address this conundrum and to think about how we can build culture, capability and capacity, not only for research impact, that's one part of our portfolio, but consumer and community involvement in research. And so this is what our program looks like, essentially. Uh, we have a consumer advisory group that we are working with in developing our program, bringing in lived experience into how we might incorporate and involve uh, consumers in the work that we do. We have an expert reference group and a community of practice which are guiding our work. And we're bringing together a consumer register so that consumers have a structured, consistent and good practice way of being partnered with researchers and that researchers have convenient access to them. 
We're building capacity through a training and seminar program and developing tools and resources and grant support. But importantly, we're also thinking about policy strategy and infrastructure. And our ethics committee and our ethics team is also actively thinking about this. Over the last couple of years, we have seen an increasing number of inquiries from researchers asking us as an ethics committee and as an ethics team to reflect and to advise on their consumer engagement activities. Now, our stance is that if it isn't research, if engagement is not research, then it doesn't, and it doesn't produce research data, then it does not require research ethics approval. Uh, but I think we're actively wondering, and I guess inviting you all to wonder with us around how we might provide better guidance to researchers and consumers in terms of the quality assurance around this work, around their engagement and around this notion of partnering. Is this work quality improvement or do we actually need another way of providing good advice and guidance uh, for consumer engagement in research? And this is something which we're actively wondering as an HREC and as a campus. And what this talks to, and Ian has talked about this really nicely, is actually kind of policy mandate now. If we want health and medical research funding, if we want to run a health service, we must be partnering with consumers. And as Ian has already said, consumers are patients and potential patients, carers and people who use healthcare services. Uh, all of us in some way are a consumer. And as we've already acknowledged, all of us bring lived experience. This guidance is actually quite clear and unequivocal. It tells us that consumers need to be involved at all levels of research activity, that they need to be seen as partners in the planning, design, delivery, measurement, and evaluation of systems and services, that they need to be partners in their own care and provided with support to build skills and engage meaningfully. And it's our responsibility as researchers, as professional staff, as clinicians, and uh, kind of managers of health services to ensure that this happens. Now, hopefully this is, um, I thought this would be um, clear. I think, you know, we've touched upon some of the benefits of partnering with consumers, but I'd like to add a couple more, particularly considering Ian's uh, devil's advocacy. But I think ultimately we know that partnering with consumers leads to better quality research and clinical outcomes. The evidence tells us uh, and our practice tells us that engaged research is more likely to improve our understanding of the issues that require attention, the context for change, the mechanisms for change, and the questions and clinical improvements that should be prioritized. I think we also acknowledge that engaged research, the partnership approaches to research are the ethical way to undertake research and clinical work, and that children, young people, and families have a right to be involved in and contribute to research that affects them. Uh, all of you will be familiar with the slogan, nothing about us without us. And I think all of us will agree, and all of us, I think in our own lived experience, will say yes to that. But I think we also know that people who use health services or live with a health condition can and do provide a different and fundamentally necessary perspective to research because of that personal knowledge and experience of research topics. For all of these reasons, it means that engaged research will be more relevant and acted upon and more likely to have an impact. And to paraphrase John Ioannidis, if you don't know his work, I'd recommend you look it up. A key contributor to, to that kind of tsunami of not particularly effective research translation is that health research frequently addresses questions and outcomes of limited relevance to other stakeholders. And so we shouldn't leave it up to research themselves to think about what is important, what is most important and valuable, that needs to be a collaborative exercise. Um, for us at Melbourne Children's, we're very interested in thinking, of course, about children and young people and lean into children's rights in this aspect, and particularly look to Article 12 of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Uh, and this is paraphrasing here, but that article says that every child has the right to express their views, feelings and wishes in all matters affecting them and to have their views considered and taken seriously. This principle recognises children and young people as actors in their own lives and applies at all times throughout a child's life. Now we're quite good at this in clinical decision making. We're less good at this in working with children and young people as partners in research. And so this is really guiding our approach here. Now, previously, I think probably the status quo has been that we do research on children. Clinicians and researchers uh, have often taken children as passive subjects of research. But what we're actively doing at Melbourne Children's is working towards doing research with children as partners and even talking about research by children. So thinking about child-led research. And there's a beautiful project at the moment going on uh, called The Voice of the Child, uh, which is drawing upon principles uh, initially espoused by Laura Lundy 
uh, reflecting on Article 12 of the Children's Convention, thinking about how we give children a voice and then how we implement that voice, how we listen to that voice and then act on what children and young people tell us. And so this is, this is our context. And in this, we have some emerging principles. Um, these aren't ratified. These are where we're starting from and we're actively sense checking these with children, with staff and, staff, and we invite you all to comment as well. But fundamentally, we are saying that researchers and research institutions engage with children and young people as partners in research. That is our starting point. And that researchers, children and young people will work together to develop and agree to a shared language to describe them and their work, getting back to that kind of definitional conundrums that we've already talked about today, and work towards shared understanding of tasks and outcomes. The researchers gain consent from children, families and young people in this engagement and that they mitigate any risk of harm in that engagement. Fundamentally, power needs to be shared and the processes and decision making underpinning these processes must be transparent and accountable. It's not good enough for the researcher to be calling all the shots behind the scenes and just telling us what's now going to happen. Of course, inclusivity, equity of access and flexibility must be built into this engagement and training, support and structured opportunities for reflection and ongoing improvement is provided to everyone, not just researchers and clinicians, but to children, young people and consumers as well. And my reflection on some of the challenges that Ian voiced uh, around consumer engagement seemed to me more about poorly facilitated engagement uh, rather than any kind of real conundrums with, with engagement if it's done, if it's done well and everyone's clear about the purpose and the processes. And ultimately, and I think very importantly, in terms of you know, kind of a Maslow's hierarchy around this, we need funding to do this work well, and everyone needs to be recognized for their commitment. And so this is work that's been based on Mitchell. Uh, this is kind of where we're starting from, but actively shaping this and, and iterating this with lots of feedback as we progress in our work. Engagement is always thought of as a, as a spectrum, and I'm just going to throw up some kind of, I'm not going to go through this as complicated, but um, I think providing us all with some useful tools to help conceptualize, this is a useful tool. I like this because it makes the commitment around the engagement very clear, and it gives us some examples of methods and levels of influence. This isn't a spectrum from bad engagement to good engagement, but people might argue that I don't think that. I think this is more a spectrum of less engagement to kind of engagement-led activities and kind of child and consumer-led activities. Um, I, I would encourage you to reflect on this. This is where we start with, with researchers who come to us asking about consumer engagement. We've done some work across Melbourne Children's and the majority of the work that's going on in this space sits around here, though increasingly we are seeing staff and indeed consumers come to us saying that they want to do child and consumer-led research and asking us how to do that. And that is a real exciting kind of conversation. Um, but I'll hand back to Nyanyel to think about different types of knowledge. Thank you, Cam. So there is a bit of a epistemological and philosophical question around knowledge, what we consider it to be, who can participate in knowledge building and the contextual factors influencing this process. When undertaking this work, it's critical to bring together different types of knowledge and perspectives to the table. There is tremendous value in engaging all stakeholders in problem solving, knowledge building. However, we do not want to apply a hierarchical approach to this exercise. Of course, the focus of our discussion today has been experimental, exper experiential knowledge or lived experience, as this is the type of knowledge that has been historically excluded from knowledge building exercises such as research. But it's also important to note that sometimes we don't even manage to bring these other types of knowledge to the table as well. And so we have a lot to do as far as improving research practice that considers all perspectives and all knowledge, all knowledge types. Thank you, Kent. Thank you, Danielle. And I think that really leads nicely to a conversation then about co-design, co-production and co-creation. And if you're feeling confused in the face of these terms, uh, take heart. Um, I think uh, in my last kind of look at the literature in this space, uh, the one consistent finding is that no one is using these terms consistently. Everyone is using these terms and everyone is doing something different. Uh, but I think we're very much in the era of the co. And I think this conversation does require us to think a little bit more about what we're talking about here. Two simple definitions that I like provided by Redmond and colleagues and Blomkamp. And they I mean, there are kind of key synergies here. They talk about collaborations between researchers and end users of research, bringing in those different holders of knowledge to jointly uh, clarify problems and develop solutions. 
and the active involvement of a diverse range of participants in exploring, developing, and testing responses to shared challenges. This comes to the heart of that partnership approach that we've been talking about, and kind of, I think, speaks to the key promise of consumer involvement. Of course, it involves the co, collaboration, connection, co-production, co collective, all of those co-words, but it also involves design, designing research priorities, questions, methodology processes, dissemination, engagement, and outcomes. It's predicated upon mutual trust and building and maintaining relationships and partnerships. We've already said that power is a huge thing that must be uh, addressed in this. So we're talking about leveling the playing field here and respecting and valuing different forms of knowledge as Nyanyal has just described. And I think really leaning in and not paying lip service to this notion of reciprocity and mutual benefit. We cannot, as representatives of the health system, be saying this is what's important because it's what we think is important. We need to come to a shared understanding of that collectively. And so if we're thinking about co-design and co-production in relation to that spectrum, this is where it sits. And the one, I think, kind of clarification around these terms, these are used interchangeably, but I think co-design is more likely at the planning phase. Co-production involves that engagement across the entire spectrum of a project. Now, I'm not going to go through this, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but I'm just going to put this up there as um, a tool that you can reflect on. A question that we're often asked is, how do we involve or why? how might we involve across a research spectrum? This is how, I'm not going to go through it, you can reflect on this in your own time, but there are all sorts of ways and all sorts of outcomes and opportunities. And there are simple tools like this one provided by Harry Shire, uh, which is a simple table that reflects on, on levels of research, stages of a project, and then looks to levels of engagement to think about, well, where might this actually work? And for what purpose might we, we begin to use this? I would encourage you to look at this if you're interested in it. Um, I'll now hand back to Nyanyal, we're almost done. But as Ken has mentioned, this is a fastly changing and evolving space. So in the context of this active evolution and discussion, how do we do this? Um, for us at the Melbourne Children's, our guiding principles towards a fairer, reciprocal and more responsible research practice are deeply rooted in these principles. So reciprocity and sustainability, as Ken has already discussed, contextual sensitivity and cultural respect, Sharing and openness, support and recognition for this work is, is really critical. Integrity and ethics, equity, inclusion and diversity are all um, critical and underpin all elements of research practice here at Melbourne Children's and enable us to strive towards you know, this more reciprocal, fairer research practice. Thank you, Danielle. And so some very quick closing reflections. What we're saying is that this work ultimately are fundamental ethical components to research. Uh, that is something that we hold uh, as true uh, and would invite conversation around that. Uh, and I think we haven't had a chance to speak about it, but I think the models, participatory models provided by mental health and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research do provide and set valuable ethical standards that we should reflect upon applying more broadly. And I think uh, to that notion of lived experience, we know that multiple communities have been severely disadvantaged, marginalised and oppressed through health and medical research. And these approaches are, are a way of addressing that. Uh, and I think that we're at a point now where we can start to say, well, these are kind of rights and approaches that everyone deserves. Engaging with kids and young people is an exciting frontier for us, and we would invite you to walk with us in that space. And But providing ethical guidance is a key area of need. We don't have enough of this. Um, I would also encourage you to think that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, you need to start small and iterate. That's probably the only feasible way to approach this. But I would say only do that in partnership with consumers. Don't try and do this by yourselves. Don't wait until it's perfect. Um, but then my final point is that we are the research culture that we seek to co-create. And everything that we say and do, we are building a research culture that Nyanyal and I, uh, I think, really hope is engaged, is ethical, and has a view to impact. And I would invite you all to have that uh, approach as well. So thank you so much. And apologies for going slightly over time. Thank you so much, Ken and the annual. That was a wonderful presentation and really beautiful. There's a number of questions in the chat, but we might have to save those to the end so that I can um, let the, the final speakers have a turn. Um, and I also would like to add to that. I'd be really interested to hear how you um, manage and give some examples of how you manage um, power within those co-design groups with children um, with lived experience. That would be a really interesting conversation uh, that we can maybe explore at the end if there's time. Um, so I'd now...